This is episode 54, and today's guest is Bo Trays. Bo is the current traveling coach for Brandon Nakashima on the Pro Tour. Bo played tennis collegiately at North Florida and the University of Nebraska. After he was done with his college career, he played four years um, professionally. And then he transitioned into coaching where he landed at the Brimer Lewis Tennis Academy in Southern California. We really liked this conversation with Bo. He has a great uh, mindset in terms of how to maximize the practice court, what, what kids should be working on, and you know how they should develop their games um, to really compete and to win at the highest levels. He also tells us how the coronavirus impacted Indian Wells and what it sort of means for him and Brandon as they're waiting for the tour to kick back up. If you are not already following us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, our handle is Payers Players. And if you'd like to contact us, we'd love to hear your feedback. Our email address is payersandplayers at gmail.com. Finally, if you haven't already done so, we'd really appreciate a five-star rating on iTunes. And if you find value in our podcast, you can donate on our website, which is www.payersandplayers.com, where you can also find all of our show notes as well of, as well as other amazing content. Hey, Bo, welcome to the show. I'm so glad that uh, you could join us. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. This is great. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Awesome. Hey, could you tell us a little bit about your tennis background, how you got started, um, where, where you played college tennis, and then uh, what you did after college? Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I started playing tennis uh, with my dad. He was a, he was a coach. Um, so he would take my brother and I to the courts with him, you know, every weekend. And I would always go there after school. And so I just kind of was, was the, the tennis pro's uh, son. You know, I just kind of a gym rat at the courts all the time. Um, and loved it right away. You know, I mean, it, it, I, I really took to the, to the individual part of it. Um, I, I just kind of fell in love. So I would just go to school and then go back to the courts with my dad. And, you know, my, my grandpa had a court at his house. So it seemed like everywhere I went as a kid, you know, there was courts and, and playing tennis was a, just sort of a part of our life growing up. Um, and I originally grew up in New York, but um, when I was 10, and my brother and sister went to college. We moved down to Florida, down to Jacksonville, my parents and I. Um, and uh, it just kind of took off from there. You know, I mean, Florida back then when I was growing up um, was, was pretty much a hotbed of tennis. I mean, there's so many good players that played Division One, And, you know, all the divisions are tough also. So Division Two, Three, One. Um, a lot of guys went on to play pros. Um, futures and challenger level um, so it was it was a cool time to kind of grow up there and and you know just be in that mix of guys throughout my junior career so it was uh you know quick quick learning there you know if you want to be good yeah. and you go to california or texas or florida you learn quickly what it's going to take you know yeah and did you, did you move from new york to florida for tennis or was that just uh, incidental to the move yeah, not not particularly. I mean, my dad is a is a uh, teaching pro, and my mom is a college professor. Um, and my my mom's parents live in Jacksonville, so we would go down there for Christmas or Easter or whatever holiday that we would have off. Um, and then when my when my brother and sister went away to college, I was just ten years old, so my parents just you know they they could both work down there. It would be better for tennis, but yeah, it was it was kind of just all work together. It wasn't really a a full commitment into tennis or anything like that. Okay. And tell us a little bit about your junior playing career and, you know, and your college experience. Uh, my junior career was, was, you know, probably very similar to a lot of guys. I mean, I played tournaments, you know, two or three weekends in, uh, a month. Um, and I would travel with my mom and dad to those events. And I mean, I was pretty good in Florida, but I wasn't necessarily um, a standout really by any means. Um, we didn't do much international travel. I didn't play any ITFs growing up. Um, you know, we didn't really have a need to leave Florida that much. Yeah. Um, yeah. so I just played a lot of those events. Um, I played some nationals and then as I got older, I started to see, you know, you, you do have to travel more. Um, but like I said, I mean, there's just such a good crop of guys, you know, within 30 or 45 minutes of me that. I didn't really need to even play that many tournaments because uh, I could just work on my game, you know, at home and, and have my dad watching. And, and, you know, I think developing, developing your game when you're a junior to me is the most important part because 
if you go and you know there's a lot of places you can go and get points and ITF points and, I, and all of that is is valuable because it does get you into the bigger tournaments but you know if you have the game when you meet those good players you'll be able to back it up and if you don't have the game and you kind of went and chased points when you meet the better players you know you'll get exposed so for me it was yeah. a lot more about development yeah and so, you so when that, you say you know, oh sorry go ahead Scott. well i was just going to ask you know that point chasing is somewhat futile now with a say utr just because mm-hmm. you know you, you know the, the points can can mask a player they can they can you know give an impression that the player is really better than he is because they have so many points but it's it's because maybe they were chasing points at these low level tournaments that other people weren't willing to go to so how do you think that that is changed with UCR yeah, I, I like UCR. I mean, I, I kind of stopped playing right as it was coming in, really. So it didn't really mm-hmm. affect me at all. Um, but I like it because I think that there's a lot of players who maybe don't have the financial resources that this game takes to really play at like the highest level. You know, I mean, it's such an expensive game, especially for kids. Um, that I think if you can, if you can, you know, win the tournaments that you're in and and get your level somewhere close to what you think it is. I think you can do it a lot easier now than having to go get your ranking on. So I, I like it. I mean, I, and I think it's a really good way to um, find practice partners and, and just kind of take care of a lot of things like that. Like men can play with boys and, you know, the, the girls can play with boys. You can find the level so much quicker now that you just know, okay, well, I'm a, I'm a 13 UTR rather than like, you know, I'm number one in Mississippi and you're number eight in California. So we're probably the same, you know, it makes it a lot easier. Yeah. So when you say develop your game, give me can you give me some specific examples of a like a twelve year old who's point chasing? What what could they be doing to develop their game? A sixteen year old sixteen year old who's point chasing? What could they be doing to develop their game? So the other day I was working with my child and we were just on the deuce side. He's a righty, and we were just mm-hmm. working on slice serve to get them out wide, and then a plus one inside out to their to the to a righty's backhand, right? Yeah, and yeah. he and so we were just working on developing that skill, so he'd be really, really good at it. So when he did go in a match, he could rely on it, use it, and then we the converse of that, do side flat down the tee, right? Yeah. So because yeah. if you're if you're out wide, out wide, out wide, they're going to start cheating. Then you go down the tee, right? So what are right. some specific things like what I just said that a, a junior could be using to develop their game? Yeah. I mean, like, first of all, that's dead on. That's exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, I think, you know, one thing that, that I do with all the guys that I work with is I think of the the most common situation that you're going to get in into a, in a match. And then you have to be absolutely rock solid at that, you know? So, so um, what I do is I break up the, I break up the court into these four different areas and I get really good. I, I, I use the guys uh, that I'm working with and I get them really good at, the performing what wins the most points, right? And and I think about that based on the level of the player that I'm dealing with, if they want to play college, if they want to be a pro or someone like Brandon, who's, you know, I mean, he's, he's a full-on pro at this point. He's trying to be the best in the world. He's trying to win slams. So very specific with him. Um, but I think with, with other guys, you can, if you watch enough matches and you understand the percentages of what's really going on out there, to me, there's not really a need to, to work on your forehand cross court or your backhand cross court necessarily, uh, you know, for an hour every single day, because that, that pattern doesn't happen in matches. You're not really going to be in a forehand cross court rally that often. Of course, you need to be able to do it. It's a great way to work on your technique. It's a great way to work on your ball striking. But I think there are much more realistic situations you can put these kids in. So like, for example, let's go specific now. Let's say you're going backhand to backhand cross, right? you could turn that drill instantly more effective if you go one back in, one inside out, one back in, one inside out. Because if you can control the ball and you can, you can have a hitting partner who can control the ball and control the drill with you, you can work on your footwork, getting from a backhand cross, kicking your right leg back and around to get into that forehand inside out position right away. And if you can get fast and smooth with that footwork, your forehand's going to get better that way. Right. And, and, you know, the, the forehand inside out is probably the most effective shot in the game, probably the most common shot in the game. So I think spending your time building that is, is really essential, you know, way, way more important than necessarily if you can hit 
80 backhands cross in a row. That That's not realistic, you know? So a, a follow-up on that would be, you know, when you're working with an 11, 12-year-old who, I mean, I, I obviously serve and return are the two most important parts of the game. But with, a, with an, a, an 11, 12-year-old who's not even five feet tall yet, what are things specific you can do to work on the serve that aren't technique because they're only going to be able to hit it so hard, right? Right, right, absolutely. I mean, I think I think for a young kid like that who's maybe not tall enough or not really into his body yet, like a, a really important part of, of your serve is landing on your left leg balanced and being able to spring back into a split so you're ready for that first ball, right? So maybe more of the focus of your serve wouldn't so much be the actual – you know, I, I'm not saying that by any means don't worry about the technique, of course. But let's just say that your technique is okay. You're not thinking about your technique. Well, then you're, right. you know, you're working on your serve and you land on your left leg and spring back. Land on your left leg, spring back. There you go. You're working on it. You're getting it more and more smooth. And, and that's a realistic situation. But when guys are attacking your second serve or whatever it might be, you're quicker there. And now you have more time when they're attacking you. Right? Oh, so yeah. I think, Good call. You know, so, so you're, you're, building time into that scenario right so that's a really good one that i like to do i mean i what i would say also is you could also work on a, on a young kid you could work on their serve and volley and you know for sure they might not be using it yet but i think as they're getting as they're going to get older as they get into college or if they turn pro it's absolutely a skill you need to be able to do you know and if you can get them used to transitioning forward towards the net at a young age they'll be able to do it when they're older you know rather than trying to teach them how to volley and move forward when they're 16 and now every match they play really matters and they might they might kind of fight you on it i think teaching those young kids how to serve on volley would be a great use of your time when you're serving um you know yeah. as well you could always do the target practice it, you know if you really zone in on their and you hone in on their variance and, and get it really tight to where they can hit their spot all that kind of stuff to me is, mm -hmm. is really valuable for those kids yeah, I, I love what you said about the serve and volley there. That's something that we do work on when we do serve. You know, I'll have him hit a bucket of ball or a bucket of serves, and, you know, he'll have to serve and volley each one of those. Then I'll hit him, you know, I'll give him the, the soft volley to put away, but, you know, forces him to come forward. You know, I think, you know, Pete Sampras, you know, he sort of had that approach when he was 14 and wasn't as su su successful as he ended up being. But, you know, he, he, you know, took his lumps when he was 14, and it paid off in the long run for sure. Yep, yep, absolutely. and and. I think if you know if you, it depends. Each kid is different, but how you deliver them the information is the most important thing. You know, you're not by any means telling them, "Hey, you're going to start being a serving ball." You're just skill building at that point. Hey, let's just work on your skill of, of transitioning forward because your footwork as you move forward is so key. And whether you move forward behind a forehand inside out or a backhand down the line or a serving volley, it's going to be sort of the same movement. And if you can time your split with the volley, I mean, it, it, it's it's it, it continues on itself in so many bigger ways than just serving ball. You know, it's really a skill building exercise. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Hey, hey, but we got a little bit of a head of, head of ourselves because I wanted to finish up, you know, how you, where you ended up in, in college and then your transition into coaching. So maybe if we could go back there really quick and, yeah. and uh, you know, tell us, tell us, you know, where you played college tennis and then how you, um, what you did after college and then how you got into coaching and, uh, picking up, pick, picking up with, uh, Brandon Nakashima. Yeah. Um, I played my first two seasons of college at the university of North Florida in Jacksonville, where I'm from. Um, and then I just, I was looking for some, some sort of a, a bigger school, a little bit more, um, sports oriented. Right. And, and I had a buddy on the team at Nebraska at the time who was also from Jacksonville and when I told him I was looking to transfer, he was like, oh, man, this is the spot for you. Um, so I went out there and I had a visit. And, you know, I really liked the coach. I really liked the whole atmosphere. I mean, Nebraska is crazy about their sports. So it was it was like exactly what I was looking for at that time. Does that include tennis? Was there a good crowd for the tennis matches? Ah, man, you're going to make it. <laughs> no, <laughs> Sorry. There, was, there wasn't a great turnout for the tennis. But there was some turnout. But I mean, football games, basketball games, yeah, all that, yeah, yeah. that college part of life. That was really right. that was really fun for me, and, and a big part of what I was looking for uh, yep. back then. And then um, after I after I finished up college, I played futures for uh, probably three or four years. But weirdly enough, I tore my bicep uh, 
twice and I was out for like 19 months. I was just rehab and I actually went back to Nebraska uh, and I was rehabbing, doing everything I could do to, to get back onto the court. Um, at that time, I think I only had a couple ATP points. Um, so, you know, I felt like my ranking is slipping away. What am I, what am I going to do? I'm going to be back into playing qualities with no points. Um, so I was really, really, uh, invested in that. Um, so I spent 19 months rehabbing and, and, you know, teaching lessons sometimes with my left hand, uh, just doing whatever I could do. Cause I was just funding my own career at that point. Um, and, uh, so what I, what I really started doing that I think got me into coaching before I really knew it is I really started studying tennis. Um, and I was just thinking like, okay, you know, if I'm going to go out and play again with my own money, uh, and I really want to want to make something, I got to know what's going on. I got to figure out how, how do these six foot tall guys survive out there? You know, I, for me, I'm six feet tall with a one handed backhand and don't have any massive weapon, but there's plenty of guys out there doing it. And how are they doing it? You know? Um, and so I got really into watching film and I, and I started to pick it up on different percentages and different patterns of play that were going on out there. And so I just started turning all of my practices into the most realistic match situations I could think of. And I just thought, Hey, I'm going to get really good at this. I've spent my whole life working on my forehand cross and I don't really ever use it. Um, so then when I started playing again, I finally got healthy. Uh, I started playing again and, and the way that I was scheduling my practices and running them really with just guys at futures, you know, on back courts in, in Dominican or Azerbaijan or wherever I was just random places you know, we all just started seeing great results because it was like, hey, we're not wasting any time now. The time is super focused and super applicable. So it was it was really good in that sense. And I think that's really where I got started kind of coaching and thinking more about how can I help these guys that are very similar to me crack through, you know, because I do think if you go and watch a future, you know, guys that are 700 in the world, I mean, they can all play. You know, if you can hit the ball clean enough yep. and you're fit enough, you know, what's separating you from being 700 to 200? And I think it's a little bit of a little bit of smart and managing the match in certain scoring situations and, and being more aware of those things rather than, you know, OK, I need to spend five more hours on the court. I think you can I think if you can change the mind of a guy who's a college guy or a futures guy, I think if you can get inside of his head and, and get him to focus on what is really turning these matches, which is only a couple points, you can start to see results with, with a lot of guys. So um, yeah. as, as soon as yeah. I stopped playing, yeah, I, I was just kind of right, right away into it because I, I thought, hey, I can help these guys that are just like me. And, and I found a lot of you know, joy and you know, it's my passion at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think you're so, so right when you said that the difference between the number 700 and 200, it, it, it is really thin. Um, but the, but the gap is huge. Um, but mm -hmm. the, the margins are so thin and, you know, if you can find, you know, find ways to, you know, to win 54% of your points as opposed to 52% of your points, you know, that you're, you're, you're going to see massive results. So I yeah. think uh, yeah. that that's so true. And so, so then after you sort of ended your playing career and you went into coaching, where, where did you end up coaching? So I ended up, I, that's how I got, I now live in Newport Beach in California. Uh, but the last turn, the last trip I went on as a player, I went down to Australia. I'd, I'd always wanted to go. There was a string of futures. I didn't have any points at that time. I was just, I'm going to go. Um, and there I connected with um, Gage Brimer, Gage and Chuck Brimer. And, um, you know, we traveled those weeks together and we practiced, you know, more or less every day and really just hit it off. Uh, because we were both in a similar spot. You know, we were both kind of, we'd reached a point where everybody was our equal, uh, if not a little bit better. And we knew we wanted to keep playing, but we needed to improve. And so we really had this kind of hunger and, and desire to just rethink everything about how we were spending our time, whether it be on the court or off the court or in the gym. And we really just got after it. And so after the last event, um, Gage invited me back to his place here in Irvine. Um, and I stayed here for probably three months practicing with Gage and Chuck at, at the Brimer Lewis Tennis Academy. Um, and I, I just, we just really got after it and Gage started taking off. It was right at the time when the rankings changed last year. So I didn't okay. have any points, so I couldn't get in. Um, and Gage had one point at that time. 
um, <laughs> so we were he could get in and you know we were just drilling and drilling and, and watching film and and really really getting into it and uh, then then Gage took off and you know he went from 1600 to 500 in, in nine months you know um, wow. so, so that gave me a lot of belief that what what I was doing and what we were thinking about was working. And, and so I just started reaching out to, uh, other guys that I had traveled with who had started to have a little bit more success. And I went on the road with a couple doubles guys and, you know, just, just really started helping everybody with sort of data and, and, Hey man, why don't we, why don't we spend this practice time doing things that happen most consistently at 30 all let's get really good at playing a 30 all point, run that pattern again. Um, and I think that's really, really what made the difference. Uh, for me, and then so I, I worked at Brian Lewis Tennis Academy uh, for a, about a year, and I would leave and go on the road with uh, with guys when I could. Um, you know, futures guys they don't have really the resources, so some challenger guys and some ATP guys, and you know, nothing really ever um, took off. I mean, it's a big expense to have a coach. Uh, sure. And then then uh, when I met Brandon. You know, it was right when he was turning pro, uh, or, you know, he, he actually, he hadn't turned pro when I met him. I met him at the open, uh, in August and, you know, we, we just hit it off right away. Um, I, I think again, maybe he didn't, he didn't reach the point where he thinks he's playing his equals yet, but I think he really knew, uh, I need to improve and I need to improve right now. You know, I need to be winning matches right now. And so mm-hmm. the guy is, is very hungry. Um, he, he loves to, to think about his game and how he can play certain scoring scenarios uh, smarter and, and manage yeah. his strengths a little bit better. And so we are really, really a pretty good match in that sense. So it's been an interesting road for me into coaching, but I really think I, I kind of coached myself for the better part of a year and a half and, and worked it all out a little bit. And then when I got with Gage, I thought, okay, this is, this is right. And then now with Brandon, you know, it's, it's always going to be different player to player, but I think if, if you can engage with them about things that they believe in and believe will help them win matches, uh, to me, that's where it really connects. Yeah. yeah. So were you, were you working with Brandon after the Open and, and so the, during the fall when he had a lot of success? Were you working with him then? Yeah. Yeah, I was working okay. with him then, and he was also spending some time um, with the USTA as well. Uh, he was really just trying to figure out if he's uh, if he was going to turn pro or not. Um, but yeah, we were working yeah. together here at Irvine, um, and then yeah, we've just kind of connected and, and kept it rolling at this point. Yeah. Okay. So, and and just some background. Brand, it, we're talking about Brandon Nakashima. Brandon was, I think, the number one recruit uh, a couple years ago. Played his freshman year at uh, University of Virginia, and um, and it's so then after his freshman year had a very successful fall and then he turned pro and has been doing really well since then. Right. So can you tell us a little bit about his results, you know, uh, since he's turned pro. Yeah. I mean, he, he, he's done really well. You know, he, he, uh, the fall of last, last fall, um, he made two semis of challengers in, uh, Fairfield and, um, Charlottesville, where he went to school at UVA, mm-hmm. um, and really, I mean, his ranking I think from the Open was around 900 or 800, 900, and then you know it just climbed steadily and steadily, you know, and, and behind those kind of results, I think everyone around him just started to see, hey, you know, he he can really do this. Um, we should really consider going pro. And then I, I know it was a really difficult situation uh, for him because he loved the the environment at UVA, he loved the coaches, he loved the team. Um, everything about it. So I know it was really tough for him. Um, but I think even, even he couldn't, couldn't argue with the results he was having. Um, and then, you know, he's continued it into this year. Um, he got to the quarters of Delray beach a couple weeks ago. That was his first ATP 250. Um, he just pushed TFO in Dallas at a challenger right before that. Um, you know, he's, he's just, really been doing great you know um yeah and yeah i I don't know exactly what his results have been of of course you know i was there i was at every event but they do they do kind of blend together and and you know you're so focused on brandon and you know helping him develop his game and and looking for what's the next thing we need at the next level okay this is great we've done this let's go to the next thing you know you get you get kind of caught up in that 
Um, but it has been really a special six six months that we've been working together, and the guy has you know earned every minute of of the success that he's gotten. Yeah, I mean, he has had a great run there at, at uh, Indian Wells, like you mentioned in the Challenger leading up to the the Masters event. He made it to the semifinals, lost to Jack Sock, had a, had a, a wild card into the main draw, and then uh, unfortunately the tournament got canceled. But so maybe you can tell us a little bit about you know what is going on on the tour right now with the coronavirus, um, I guess, uh, suspension of play for the next six weeks. And, and so maybe what, what happened there at Indian Wells? How did that announcement come out? And then, you know, what was your all's reaction to it? And what are y'all doing um, in, in light of that? Yeah, I mean, it was a real, a real bummer, like you said. I mean, he, he played the Indian Wells Challenger and got to the semi and, you know, had his chances against Jack. Um, and then he got awarded the wild card. And so we were pumped and, and we were ready, ready to go back to work for the child, for the, for the masters. Um, and then I forget what night it was that it got canceled, but I remember Brandon telling me, and, and I kind of thought he was kidding. I, I mean, I, you know, they had started implementing you, you got to get your own towels. The ball boys are going to wear gloves. Um, everybody has their own drink. They had implemented some rules that, you know, we were all, you know, okay, that's fine. No big deal. Um, and then when he told me, you know, it was just, we were just sort of shocked at first. Um, you know, of course, it's just such a big opportunity that, that you're ready for and that you're thinking, hey, we're playing well, we're going to go into this and, you know, maybe do do better than people expect and really make a splash onto the tour. Um, and to have that taken away is, is really tough. And then, you know, of course, we were thinking, all right, well, if Indian Wells is canceled, we'll go play the Phoenix Challenger and, and Miami. And then sort of day to day, it just sort of started getting worse and worse. And then once they said, you know, players from Italy and France and Germany and Korea have to self quarantine for 14 days. And that's uh, a lot of guys on the tour. So, or, yeah. you know, everybody was kind of thinking there's no way all those guys can't play now. Um, so it, it, no one, no one really knew, but it kind of snowballed, you know? Um, yeah. But it was, it was strange at first because, you know, what are you going to do? This is, this is what we do. And it's, you know, time to go back to practice and hopefully, you know, focus on Phoenix and Miami at the time. And so everybody was there acting totally normal, you know, player dining is open. You can get your, get your court reservation, you got your rackets down, you got the locker room, you know, it was normal life for us. There's just no Indian Wells, but um, yeah. you know, you, you're definitely hearing it through the guys in the locker room or at lunch, wherever, you know, guys are sort of talking and, and everybody sees it coming. So it wasn't too much of a surprise, but now the tour has been, you know, canceled or put on hold for the next six weeks. So it's, it's an interesting time. You know, we're just trying to figure out what's the best way to spend these six weeks. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's sort of like you have this, uh, like everyone always complains that there's no off season in tennis. Now it seems like there is. And so you have six weeks to work on the, the game, work on, you know, what you, what, you know, whatever you need to work on without the, you know, interference from tournaments that, uh, you know, which makes it hard to work on specific things. So um, I'm sure you guys are have a plan in place for that for the next six weeks. And maybe you can share something about that if it's not too uh, proprietary. Yeah, I mean, I probably I probably won't tell you exactly what we're working on, but exactly. I mean, that's that's the mindset that we have at this point is, all right, well, it's just a, a preseason again. You know, I think that one one really good thing for us is that, you know, and, and for Brandon is that he's played against multiple top 100 players now and he, he feels like he belongs. He's proven that he belongs. So, you know, there, there are things in his game that we're working on. You know, as always, there's, there's always going to be things that can get better and that you want to keep that mentality of, I just want to see how good I can get. You know, that's really our mentality every day. Is, Let's try and get as good as we can get at this game. Um, but more specifically for Brandon, it's going to be, you know, a lot of fitness because, uh, you know, he can just get so much stronger and faster and, and hopefully the slams are coming up and then that's going to be three out of five. So this break is, we're looking at it as a positive, you know, uh, uh, this gives us a great chance to take a little break from tournaments, really focus on his body, get him healthy and strong and, and ready to feel like if I get a shot at a three out of five set match this year, I'm ready. You know, that that's going to be the goal for these next six weeks for us. Yeah, and you can see pros like Noah Rubin 
who uh, he posted on Twitter that he's taking spots for for teaching lessons. So if you're in the New York mm-hmm. area, he said, if you need some lessons, I'll teach. I mean, it really is kind of crazy how all the tennis players are basically independent contractors. And when the tour shuts down, they're, they're kind of, they just kind of scatter, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's wild. Everybody was, yeah. Uh, I, I didn't know that Noah's doing that, but yeah, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, everybody just he goes back to where they're from and, you know, you get in the gym and, you know, hopefully if you have a team around you, like a coach and a physio and all that, it's taken care of. But a lot of guys don't have that. So yeah, they're just kind of to themselves. Yeah. 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 He, and actually, he's a really good. He's a really good follow on Twitter. If you get a chance to follow him. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll check him out. Yeah. <laughs> All right, hey Robert, do you want to get back to the conversation we were starting to go down before um, about you know sort of pattern play and how uh, that that uh, should be developed in a, in a developing player? Yeah, one of the questions that I had, and, and I always have wondered this because because Scott, who's the guy that for the pro tour that always talks uh, about o- o- O'Shaughnessy? Or- O'Shaughnessy. Yeah. So Craig O'Shaughnessy is always talking about the majority of points happen in the pro tour between zero and four balls and all that kind of stuff. And so I always wonder at what point, at, at what point does a player have enough skill that you can work on pattern play like we were talking about, like serve out wide, forehand to uh, inside out. You know, because if they can't rally and if they can't volley and if they can't serve, that's really a waste of time. So kind of what's your thought on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think once you start thinking about pattern play and and using percentages like O'Shaughnessy uses them, I think the first thing you got to say to the player and the coach whoever's dealing with it is that, hey, do you have total control over what's going on out here? You know, because you you can't you can't build a point unless you have total control, and that means you've thought it through before the point happens. You can make adjustments in the point to to make sure that the pattern still happens. You know, so I think. Yeah, there's there's a absolutely a level of skill that you need to have before you start thinking about ending points in the first four balls. Just because, you know, if you give that information to the wrong kid, now he thinks, okay, well, I'll just I got to go for the line. I, I got to end the point. That's what the pros do. The pros aren't really looking to end the point, you know, with necessarily a, a screaming forehand inside out winner that skids off the corner of the line. You know, in, in my opinion. The, the real skill to be building is is ball recognition and understanding different scoring situations. You know, is this the right ball to try to take and, and create offense with, or would I be better off staying neutral? Would I be better off playing defense here? That to me is the most important skill because the techniques are all going to be different. I mean, if you look around the tour, everybody's forehand's different. Everybody's serve is a little bit different. There's key component components, but overall, no one looks the same except maybe Fed and Dimitrov. You know, um, but I do think I think using those percentages as guidelines is good. But I think understanding risk and understanding when the right ball to take is is a much more um, apt guide for most players. You know, uh, it's not really in my head whatsoever to try to push a rally to eight balls, because what if you get offense on the third ball? And, right. and it's the right ball for you to take, man. You got to take it. In my opinion, it, I think the, the best players out there are playing to win. And, and that means that they're playing offense. I don't think maybe in juniors, you know, you could make a case that people who maybe moon ball or you could call it pushing and, and just play defense. Maybe those guys win. But I mean, there there's no one really like that. That's making a professional career out of staying neutral and or playing defense, you know, uh, yeah. I think if you can build that, if you can build the kid, the skills of offense, um, and that's something as simple as like a, a pattern that I, so I do a lot of, uh, work with kids online, uh, when I'm on the road with Brandon, because it's, uh, I love it, you know, and I, I like helping kids like that, but so I'll schedule a kid's practice and, and let's say you're going forehand inside out. Um, you're, you're a 15 year old kid and you're going forehand inside out. Now you're going forehand inside out. And, and then you, you have a section of the court down uh, close to the alley where you'd pull a ball forehand inside in, right? Let's say it's a righty. So you're going inside out, inside out, inside out until you get the right ball to pull down the line and pull it inside in. Now you put a, a section of the court up there and you, you work on the kid's variance, right? How, how accurate is he really with his forehand inside in? 
and you got to get it into that area 10 times and then we'll move on. And a drill like that clearly shows them, man, why is this taking me 30 minutes? You know, and you, you can sort of convince them just through, through facts of, Hey man, let's do it. You want to hit your forehand inside in. Awesome. Let's do it. But now let's see how long it takes to get 10. And, and maybe it takes a while for the first couple of weeks, first couple of times you do it, but you can see over time, it goes from 10 minutes to five minutes to four minutes to now it only takes 15 balls. You're not, you're not picking the wrong ball. And I think that can help your execution just as much as, as working on your technique is working on, is this the right ball to take line? Okay. Take it. Don't overhit it. Don't use too much speed or look for too much depth, you know, be, be controlled, but look for the right ball. And you'll see that, that especially juniors, a lot of the kids that I work with, you know, they're just taking the wrong ball. And and I think yep. a large part of it is thinking, hey, forehand, I mean, uh, pros just absolutely crush their forehand. They don't really crush. No one's really swinging out of control. I mean, if you're, I'm on the court with these guys every day. There's not that many balls that are out of control. Maybe they try for some crazy shots sometimes, but the vast majority of the shots they hit are well inside of what they can control. You know? Yeah. And so... so- Hey, hey, Bo, could you t- take us back a little bit and just help us define what that, um, you know, what the right ball is? So uh, here's when, I, when, I, when I'm hearing you explain that, what I'm, what I'm visualizing is, you know, either I'm hand feeding or I'm feeding, you know, my, my son, you know, inside out forehands that are sort of deep in the court where he's got to play somewhat neutral. So he's hitting that inside out, but he's not being super aggressive with it. Um, but when he gets a short ball inside the court, then that's when he goes down the line. Is that is that is that the right ball you're talking about? Um, yeah, it is. It, it, it would be yes, it, the right ball. I do think though, like you know, when when you can see a live ball coming at you, you can see you know how you're going to set up to hit it if it's going to be in your strike zone. And I think learning where your strike zone is is absolutely critical to to any player who wants to be you know very good and and get to to their potential you've got to know where your strike zone is because a lot of guys have a different strike zone it's not necessarily a a waist high ball that's the one you like to hit you know i mean with these strings and these rackets now a lot of guys can move their strike zone around so like yeah I, i think you've gotta vary what the right ball is and and that's where it takes real sort of conscious effort and, and honesty by the player. Hey man, did you, you know, after he hits it, Hey, did you really think was that the right ball to take inside in to a low percentage play? And then the, the, the child, he has to be honest about it and say, yes, I just missed it. Or maybe mm-hmm. I should have stayed down more through the ball, or maybe I tried to hit it too fast, whatever, or nah, you know what, dad, you're, you're right. That was the wrong ball. I got impatient. You know, that, that level of, of talking to the kid, that's where I see the most improvement because then they, it makes it clear to them when they're in a match, oh, this is that ball. I can take this one over there. You know, they're, they're just yeah. looking for the right ball. And then you're managing all the other ones probably towards your opponent's weakness and staying neutral. That, that, that's the way for me. Well, and here's the thing is, you know, people talk about kids being a problem solver. And, and I can't decide, like, I, I, I don't know very many kids who recognize at 11 years old that a lefty on the ad side is going to hit them out wide and then, and then go inside out with their forehand like Nadal does. Right. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. so I, as a coach, I think it's important for the coach to think of what are the most common patterns for a riding the lefty on the deuce and the ad side to prepare the kid to kind of expect them. Right. I mean, I think about like Tom Brady, people all think, well, he's a great football player. He's also well coached. Right. So, Mm -hmm. And the mm-hmm. coaches have, have continually talked to him about if the corners do this, you do this. If the safeties yep. do this, you do this. And so uh, what are some of those things that you prepare your player for? Like what, do you, what are the most common patterns you see for a righty on the deuce and ad side serving and a lefty on the deuce and ad side serving? That helps parents to talk to their child about, you know, you're playing a lefty today on the ad side, expect that slice out wide, right? Yep. And, and I, I think those things are, are, relatively basic right a lot of lefties like to use the slider wide the righties slice wide as well but what i think is is one level maybe past that is okay you tell them that it's going to happen but then what are they supposed to do about it 
to me, that's that's the part that was always kind of missing for me. Absolutely, so it, I, I agree. When 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 you see that he's going to go slider wide, right? The highest percentage return probably. Let's say it's a lefty. He's on the ad side. He's going slider wide. Almost at all costs, you got to get that that return down the line. It doesn't matter if you got to slice it or what, because if you give him that inside out forehand, he's gonna he's gonna make it. That's his money ball, right? Uh-huh. That's right. So you know already. Hey, don't try to don't try to force it cross and get it deep cross right into his forehand again. Do what you can do. Take your your margin, right? I'm not saying by any means rip it line looking for a winner. But get that ball line and now see what his backhand cross can do. Because I bet you can catch up to his backhand cross a lot better than you can catch up to his forehand inside out. You know? Yeah, and, and so, I, I think that's real a real challenge for kids, especially an 11, 12-year-old, because they're working with their coach. And, and the majority of kids they play are going to be a righty, right? Yeah. So the, the yeah. coach is working with them on, I'm a righty, you're a righty, I'm going to hit forehands inside out. So then the yeah. kid in practice is on the ad side. And the coach is like, hit your returns uh, inside out to their backhand. And really what would be better is if the coach would say, hit it to their weakness, right? Because then the yeah. players has to think like, okay, well, what is their weakness, right? This is a yeah. lefty, yeah. so it would actually be down the line. So I, I like what absolutely. you're saying. Absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, to me, absolutely that's right. You know, and and like I was sort of saying about chasing points, you know, if you have a great forehand return inside out on the ad side, guy's not going to give it to you. You're going to get exposed that your backhand return down the line doesn't exist. Someone's going to expose it, you know, and, and that's when it's really going to matter. So that's where even, even with the pros that I work with, man, it's just skill building. If you don't like hitting your backhand down the line return, that's fine. I'm not saying you should, but you're going to need to once or twice a match. So let's spend 15 minutes working on it, 45 minutes working on it. Everything else is solid, man. Let's work on that one shot and just think of it like skill building I'm not saying you got to use it but it's a you're going to need to use everything you got to beat your equal you know and so when you Love face it. your equal yep you you got to have everything prepared and, and that's where i think how you deliver the information to kids especially young kids like that is is really important and and you know i remember getting caught up my coach is telling me to take my back and return down the line you know i'm not telling you to do that necessarily i'm just saying you should be able to and then, you know, and then, and then, you know, you set up a target or, or some area on the court and you, you throw that slider wide to him until he gets 10 back in returns into that target. You, you give the target margin, you give it safety. You tell him about what kind of shape you're looking for on that return. You tell him exactly how to do it. And, and you train that, you know, you're not looking for the screamer line, you know? So I think, I think in a lot of ways you can deliver these kids the right information it's just all about how you give it to them you know and and how you train what you train and yeah i mean you you certainly can't just have you know one or two shots that are good you know you you have to be able to do everything in today's game on clay or on hard so i think you really need to focus on getting every return like i think a a really underutilized serve uh return this is something we've been we've been working on is the second serve on the even side, they kick back in and you take that return inside out down to their forehand. That's a great way to catch, to catch a guy off guard and to get on offense. It's the long part of the court, the short part of the net. You can absolutely hammer that thing. Not that many people hit it because most guys take that return line. You know, for sure, that's the better play. But being able to do both, that's the trick. That's what at 30 all, three all, that's what somebody's going to do to you, and then they're going to break you, and then the hold and the set's over, you know. Uh, so I think I think having all the shots, and then having the awareness and the, the understanding of when to play them—that's the key. That's how you get so it. So are you are you a righty or a lefty? I'm a righty. So when you're working with a kid and you want to work with him on what you just said, mm-hmm. all right, I'm on the ad side. I'm a lefty. I'm going to hit you that slider out wide. How do you simulate that? Because obviously you're not a lefty, so do you get yeah. a lefty to come and hit it? What do you do to kind of simulate that? I mean, if, if I could get a lefty, that would be ideal. Um, but no, I would just if it's if it's me doing it, I would just hit a, a flat serve wide. I mean, it, it skids and jumps out there, similar to a lefty. But to me, it's not so much about dealing with the lefty spin. It's getting the kid to to realize what the right play is and get that return down. 
they can adapt. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. As far as I'm concerned, you know, I mean, gotcha. Yeah, I, I don't worry about playing a lefty or a righty too much. I, I think that's kind of like, you know, you you can't go out of your way to to fly in a lefty, you know, or drive you know, <laughs> ask a lefty ask a lefty to drive 30 minutes to hit with you. Uh, you can't always get it like that. Yeah. But yeah, if, like I say, if you if you step into the court a little bit as a righty and just take make an angle, you can. I guess you know, like you're saying, it's, it's close enough. You know, you can't get the right spin on it, but you're going to get the right placement. Yeah, if you if you can push that that child, you know, out outside the doubles alley to hit the return, that, that's where he needs to be. You know, so you can't get it perfect, but you can get it, you know, good enough. Yeah, yeah, and so you know, I, I think it's really interesting the way you you use video and stats. But what are some stats that you use that maybe aren't obvious? Um, you know, when you're charting a match, what do you really look for in terms of you know numbers and you know things like that, or is it specific to the particular matchup, or you know how yeah. do you incorporate stats into your sort of match review with Brandon or any any other player? Yeah, I mean, like one one stat that I'm pretty I love, I absolutely love is that if you approach uh, okay <laughs> ready to go with me down this rabbit hole here uh yeah so i would consider i would consider a passing shot one where where the guy gets a good look at it you know if you're on the absolute mm-hmm. dead run and you got to hit a slice forehand that's not really your forehand pass right but right. if you're there and you've got to use a little bit of judgment when you're watching the film and think you know what was he kind of set did he have a look at that pass and, and as long as the answer is yes then i would count that as a pass right and mm-hmm. one thing that I've found on the on the, the ATP tour and the Challenger tour is that if you approach the backhand and you you have you give the guy a look at a pass, not an easy one, but you approach the backhand, you're going to win that point 83% of the time. Hmm. Two, 2% of the time, that first pass that he hits is going to be a winner. Almost like 70% of the time, he's going to hit the ball to you to give you a volley and then right? He's going to try to get it low, track down the second one, hit that one for a winner. That's a typical pattern on a pass, right? First one low, mm-hmm. track down the second one. If you approach the forehand, you're going to win 54% of those points. So now you take the difference there. So anytime you get a, a weird shank or, or somehow you end up coming into the net when, when you didn't necessarily build the point that way, you don't know where to hit the, hit the approach, man, play it to the backhand. Take the odds of those percentages, if he beats you with his backhand, too good. But guys are going to beat you with their forehand. It's it's been shown, and and you know a running forehand pass it looks great. It's not that hard, really. You know, it, right. it, it's not as hard as it as it seems to be. Cool, you know. Um, yeah. Another, you know, so that's a that's a and that can go to helping you transition forward to the net. How do I get to the net better? Well, you got to get you'll get more comfortable once you're winning there more. How do you win more? You approach the backhand more than the forehand. You know, yeah, and, and you know th- that that's you know, and, and, and it's also hard because like my son's a lefty, so everything is reversed. So if he's if he's approaching to the backhand, maybe he's approaching to his open side, if you know what I mean. So if he's you know winding up for you know if if he's approaching to the backhand side from the sort of I guess uh, do side, you know he's he's ex- that, that whole side of the court is exposed. So it's, does that matter if it's a, if it's the righty lefty or is this just righty righty? Um, no, no. For me, for me, this is this is purely which side would you rather lose to? His strength or his weakness? Okay. Yeah, lose to his. If he can hit a backhand down the line pass, even though it's wide open, be mm-hmm. good. That's fine. Right. I'll take that. You know, um, I don't worry too much about approaching line and 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 things like that, just because the stats that I have, and, and I know that I'm working at a very different level than 15 year old, uh, junior tennis. So it could be different. You know, I, I might be yeah. totally off on this, but at, right. at the pro level, I'm just thinking about man, make his backhand beat you, you know? And that's what I tell every, all the players that I work with, not necessarily just Brandon, but everybody, um, you know, and then I also work with some doubles guys. And, and I think a really interesting stat is, about doubles and this could help a lot of juniors probably is do you would you take a guess at in an atp doubles match how many balls land in the alley either alley whether it's a lob or a volley or a passing shot or what every single shot how many balls I'd land in the alley not many yeah i mean three percent of shots really 
Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's just a different way of saying the typical, Hey, cover the middle. You know, you've you've heard that everybody says, Hey, cover the middle. Right. Great. That works. That totally is the same thing. But if you say, Hey man, 3% of shots are going to land in the alley. They're like, Oh, I'll give up the alley. No worries. Okay. Hit one back and return down the line and got me in the alley. Fine. That's okay. (laughs) You know? And so I think, I think if you can approach, you know, and also I'm dealing with, you know, men and, and guys who are playing for their job and they fully understand that strategy is important. You know, they're not really getting too caught up in the emotional side of it. Then it really helps, you know, because yeah. they, they can just let it go off their back. All right, well, that's only going to happen 3% of this whole match. I'll give that up. And if they burn me, you know, three or four times, maybe then I'll start to guard on it a little bit. But I, I'm going to take the middle. I'm going to take away the meat of what happens in this match. And I'm going to try to play the odds that way. And, and you know, that's a, a really calming presence to have in your mind when you know the stats of, of what should happen in a, in a normal match. And if somebody plays lights out or, or something, some sort of uh, outlier happens, well, maybe that's just wrong place at the wrong time for you, you know. Oh, hey, hey uh, um, so, yeah, could you give what you would, what advice would you give to parents that, you know, have kids in terms of, you know, the, the practice or their attitude or, or anything? Um, what, you know, so maybe, you know, just from your experience and what would you say, you know, if you had some, to give some advice to parents, what, what would you give them and generally? Hmm. I, I think it's a tough question. I mean, I, I would yeah. say that the most important thing, you know, for players to, to keep in mind, especially a junior is, you know, make sure that you're just going towards your potential, you know, go, go try to be as good as you can be. Don't necessarily take it too heavy. If you turn out to be number one, or if you turn out to be number 400 in your state or in the country, whatever it is, just try to be as good as you can be. Uh, the, the other stuff you can't control, you know, I, I know that's so hard to really feel when you're the one in it, but that would, that would be my best advice is go towards your potential and, and work as hard as you can and and let the chips fall where they may. Um, you know, I, I don't know what it's like to be a parent. I I haven't gone through that. So (laughs) that the pressure that that parents have watching their kid, I don't know that. And I don't want to, I don't want to pretend that I know how to do it better than any of them because I, I don't. Um, but I think just keeping that going towards your potential, trying to be as good as you can be in mind, I think that's really a big key because, you know, this game is so big. I mean, it's a universal game. You never know how good these guys are from Spain or Germany or wherever you never heard of. Uh, they turn up and they're, they're nails at the tournament. You might never even know. Um, so I think just keeping that as the overall goal is probably my biggest um, advice for players and, and for parents. Just remembering, you know, hey, are, are we going towards your potential? Then. Uh, that's okay then. What, as long yeah. as you can answer that with a yes, then you're good. Yeah. So I, one of the things that uh, Adam Blitcher on his podcast always asks is, "What is one thing that you believe to be true that everyone else will think is crazy, or something to that effect?" What What is that one thing that you you think is true that every time you say it, people think you're a nut for saying it? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> That's a really good question. I haven't heard that before. Yeah, every time he says it, I love it. One thing that I think is true that everyone else thinks I'm crazy for saying. And it doesn't even have to be Uh, everyone else. It could be the recreational tennis community thinks you're a nut. But when you get on the pro tour, everybody thinks it to be true, right? Because sometimes the pros understand it and everybody else doesn't get it, right? Yeah, I would say that... mm, Man, there's, I, I feel like there's a couple things I would say. Maybe I would say that. Well, tell us, tell us a couple things. Yeah, I would say, I would say, ball control is the most important skill you can have. How, how and, do you mean? And, uh, yeah, I, I don't mean, I don't mean pushing. I don't mean not missing. I mean, you know, the the pass that you got to hit at at fifteen thirty to get up fifteen forty, or the stab volley you got to make at deuce, or some intangible shot that you don't necessarily work on 
but it seems like that kid who's number one in the state is consistently making it and he's getting out of trouble against, you know, the number seven guy. To me, that's all ball control. And, and you can see it at the top level when you, if you get the chance to watch a real pro's practice, I mean, everything is, is all about control, all about control. And, and, and if you can put the ball into this area of the court from this spot or something like that, mm-hmm. to me, it's, it's really like being, being one with the ball almost. You can make that thing do what you yeah. want. That is the, the biggest skill that I would work on. And, and that's where and, in the and, practices. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think you may be you may be going there, but I was just going to say, how do you develop that skill? Right, and, and is that's it not just think, natural? No, I think you can learn it. I think you can learn it, okay. and I would, I wouldn't say that you can learn it if I hadn't if I don't if I didn't feel like I had done it for myself at the last time that I was playing with uh, with Gage Brimer when we were when I first got out here. I mean, that is all we worked on. What can I do with the ball in a, in a controlled way? And then if I can take that controlled way into matches i can win matches i can win matches because i know that i'm doing what i can do you know rather than kind of looking for that forehand inside in or that backhand down the line that might go in two out of ten and i take the risk and i bet on that no nah, you can't play like that no one's playing like that you know they, they might be able to hit the back end on the line they might hit it but i bet you they can hit it eight out of ten times and so that's why they do it you know and, and so giving yourself margin and, and building your game around your variance to me that's the key and that that's how you get it is the ball control um so what's the other thing you believe to be true that that everyone else probably thinks is crazy man um i would say maybe for for a junior i would say return of serve is is should be king in your practices i mean and, if you were gonna have a good return I feel like I never practiced it as a kid growing up. I, I rarely see kids practicing it. And it, it's just such an invaluable skill to be able to break. I mean, is is just going to make your life so much easier. I would say, you know, at least, you know, 20 or 30% of your practice time should be return of serve. Yeah. yeah that, uh, so how do, you, that how do you practice it? Like, do you do you hit serves to the player from the service line? Do you tell them I'm going to hit it out wide here? What are what are yeah, your I mean, objectives think, I think in a twenty minute practice can, on return? Yeah, you can do it a bunch of different ways. I mean, I do that with Brandon every single day. Hey, I'm going to go. I, I stand, you know, probably somewhere halfway between the service box and the uh, and the baseline. Hey, Brandon, I'm going kick tee. Let's get ten inside out, ten inside in makes. Right, and then you you get to ten, move on. Okay, I'm going slider wide uh, on the even side. Let's get ten cross, ten line. Okay, you got ten, Love move it. on. And then Love sometimes I'll, I'll just stand there at the service line and say, hey man, let's have a little bit of fun, maybe a little bit looser. I'm gonna try to ace you. Don't let me ace you. If I ace you three times in a row, you're buying dinner. Something like that. I mean, it's it. You can keep it fun. You can keep it ordered. You can keep it structured. You know, all that kind of stuff. You can work on. The, what you do with your first step after the split. Are you moving diagonally forward or are you kind of standing still? Are you moving back maybe? There's so many things that you can think about on the return that to me just go totally unnoticed until you maybe get to college and guys are serving bigger and, and your coach is saying, wow, you know, we need to work on your return. I would work on that now. Whatever yeah. age you are, I would work on that. I mean, well, yeah, you, you know, know what, I, what, I, what I love about what you're saying is this is, is one of the things I think I would say that most people think I'm crazy, and I know nobody asked, but I'm going to say it anyway, is I think I think that parents try to squeeze more out of their kid than is available. And so they mm-hmm. go to all these academies and they go to all these places with these gurus. And, and in reality, I think two things. First, talent will overwhelm. If you're good enough, you'll be good enough. And second... Mm-hmm. The practice is simple. I mean, what you're describing is not brain science. It's simple. Any parent with any ability could get out there and conduct a practice with their child to teach them how to how to return, how to serve, or hire a, a high school kid or a college, you know, junior college kid to say, "Hey, I, you're a righty. I need you to hit a slider out wide. My kid's going to hit the return, you know, plus two or something." So it's not it's not brain science. And all these people spending tons of money and uprooting their family and going to all this homeschool, it they're 
if the kid's good enough, they'll be good enough. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I, I, I think there's there's no there's no getting away from a certain level of talent that you need to have, certain level of athleticism that you need to have, and hard work. I mean, it, none of it's get, none of it's going to come easy. You know, I mean, no matter no matter what level you want to get to, and that's where to me, even even with Brandon, even though he's a pro and it seems like it's all you know, gravy for him, man, if you're not going towards your potential, to me, you're doing it wrong. You know, like, it it doesn't have to be hard work, like, you know, you're in the dirt, and you're bleeding, and it's the hardest thing you've ever done. But, you know, (laughs) you've got to, you got to get those hours in. And and if you can think about it, like, hey, I'm just trying to be good, I'm trying to be as good as I can be. To me, that that's the way. And yeah, there's, there's no, you know, your return only gets better if you hit returns, your forehand only gets better if you hit, hit forehand. You know, so I, I totally agree with you. I think for sure there are there are coaches probably everywhere that could that could get the right kid to, to the level they want to be at. You know, and, and I think, again, how you deliver that information to the kid, if you really understand the player and, and he listens to you and he believes what you're telling him is in his best interest or her best interest. I mean, that that coach will make it work for you, you know, and that that's again to me where like the honesty of the kid and, and the coach, are you guys really doing what you need to be doing? Cause if you are, it'll, it'll show and you'll get the results you want. And if, if you're not, it doesn't matter if, you know, uh, the, the world's best coach is, is on the court with you. If you're not going to get it and, and really learn that skill, you're not going to get it. Yep. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So, so yeah, just one quick, um, anecdote about that return to serve practice and maybe how we can how how, how it can be applicable to you know juniors is you know when i was working with return to serve with my son i was doing a lot what you were doing with brandon in terms of all right i want you to hit inside out if it's if it's here you hit inside out if it's over here you hit cross and and, and i think for for his level it was a little bit too difficult because he was thinking and he was trying to execute you know uh, something that wasn't you know maybe natural to him and he mm-hmm. wasn't having much success with it. And so instead we just said, okay, from now on, let's go down the middle. And then once you develop that and you're very comfortable with that, then we can go a little bit more, you know, detailed in terms of, you know, situational returns. But, you know, I think it, it, at a, at a young age and a developing skill base, hitting that serve deep down the middle will build a strong foundation. Cause you know, that's sort of the Djokovic plan is, you know, just yep. to neutralize that first serve. No, don't be trying to go, you know, down the line or, you know, sharp angle cross court until you're more, much more skilled. So, um, you know, I think, yeah, you know, a good point, Scott. Stat. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, an interesting stat that I could tell you is this is a bit up to me kind of watching and, and trying to guess at what the player's intent was. But at the ATP level, I, I've got it in, in my head that 88% of returns are hit just to start to, to stay neutral. So maybe flip it on the other side. 12% of returns are hit looking to immediately do damage with that first ball right. with, with right. the return, whether it's a forehand cross or a backhand angle or, or some version of an aggressive return. Guys are really not returning that aggressive in terms of what you would look at. But what's really aggressive about their middle returns is that deep middle. You're starting to point that guy has no angle. And he's hitting the yep. ball right off his feet. That's a, an aggressive return. It's got tons of margin in it. That, that you tons can of margin. But off to the next one. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So I think, well, hey. Yeah. Just getting getting past that. You know, aggressive doesn't necessarily mean it's a winner. That's true. You know? uh, well, well said. Exactly. Well, hey, Bo, we we appreciate your time, and I know that it's uh, probably dinner time for you out there in California. So we don't want to hold you any any longer than we have to. But, you know, you, you mentioned that you um, do some consulting maybe by video. Is there a way that people can get in touch with you if they wanted to get some advice on how to run a practice or, or anything else? Is there a way that they could uh, reach you and, and you'd be available for that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, would, would you like me to just send you maybe my email? Um, and then you can... Yeah, well, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what, why, why don't you... Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll put it in the show notes, but you can go ahead and say it here as well if it's uh, yeah, not okay. complicated. Yeah, if, if you're looking for for anything in terms of helping your practices, yeah, absolutely. You could reach me uh, on an email at beauregardtrays at gmail dot com. That would be b e a u r e 
G-A-R-D-T-R-E-Y-Z at gmail.com. Or, you know, if you want to put your, your child in touch with me, they can always find me on Instagram. Um, it's just Bo Trays, B-E-A-U-T-R-E-Y-Z. It'll be easy to find. And you can just send me a, a direct message and we can we can start to uh, look into practices. Absolutely. I think, you know, giving these, giving these kids a structure and, and something that they can see is applicable to their game would be awesome so if you if you're looking for that absolutely reach out to me and we can we can start building that for sure very very cool yeah very cool so hey bo um so again thanks so much for for coming on we really enjoyed the conversation and hopefully we can catch up uh later in the year when uh everyone's back playing tennis yeah hopefully i hope so Uh, (laughs) hopefully it's coming sooner than later excellent excellent. all right man well hey great enjoyed it yeah, and, uh, tell tell Brandon good luck, and we uh, we 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 look forward to more more success more success from him in the future. Yeah, thank you guys. It's a pleasure. Talk to you soon. All right, take care. Bye. All right, bye. Bye.